And we are starting on page 28 of the manual. We're going to hit a couple more scriptures here. And then move, we want to move into the next section very quickly. But you will see on page 28, starting there at Ephesians 3. And many of you have said you've already heard New Man before, so you know kind of where we're going, hopefully with this, at least in the beginning for the groundwork, and then we'll go from there. And that's probably why... Um, we're sensing the difference in the spirit of where we're going to be going, able to go with this because you've already heard it, so you have a good grounding, so we should be able to go further and deeper and better. So, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. This is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Now, here's two things to know. Number one, most people talk about we, want, we need to get back to the church in the book of Acts. I don't know about you, I'm not too fond of people dropping dead. Okay? <laughs> Just, uh, you know, it's, everybody says that they want to see the, the church in the book of Acts again. Uh, well, we want to see the good parts. But you have to remember, the church in the book of Acts was a baby church. It was an infant church. It was not mature. They were figuring things out as they went along with the help of the Holy Spirit. But it definitely was not the uh, mature spiritual church it definitely was not the glorious church that was described in the book of Ephesians. And so technically, if we want to look at anything, we should look, just like we look at the book of Acts, we ought to look at the church in the book of Ephesians as somewhat of a model that we could look at to emulate. But we also have to realize that in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus had something against the Ephesians, right? And so he told them that there were some things they had to do and that he wasn't uh, thrilled with it. But you also have to re realize that the book of Ephesians was written uh, around 60 some odd A.D., maybe around 67 A.D. in that time, uh, 62 to 67. And the book of Revelation was written in the 90s, 90 A.D., in that time period. And so within a short 30-year period, the glorious church of Ephesus had degenerated into a church against which Jesus had some issues, right? So just because you have a place doesn't mean you maintain that place just by reason of seniority, right? Uh, there is an actual progress that you have to make. Now, Paul says, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, or towards you. In other words, may, he said, he's telling... He's telling the Ephesians, uh, if you've heard the message, the grace of God, this dispensation, this thing that I've been given, if you've heard that, uh, that I've been given this for you. Notice he didn't say I've been given this because I'm super spiritual. He said I've been given this for you. And so we need to realize that revelation and understanding is, was never meant to be the possession of a person by which they would try to somehow... Uh, gain fame, notoriety, fortune, or whatever else. Whatever God pours out to anyone is for everyone. Amen? Amen. Here's another point. <clears throat> Paul told, uh, actually, it was the Ephesians at one point, where he said, as I have taught in every church. Right? What that means is, Paul didn't go from church, he didn't go to the church in Colossians and say, okay, I have a word for you. Here it is. Right? And then he goes to Ephesus and goes, okay, now God gave me a word for you. No, Paul said, every church I go to, I preach the same message, right? That, now, I'm not saying that there couldn't be specific things he had to address. Obviously, he did. He had to address things uh, with the Colossians. He had to address things with the Corinthians. So, yeah, there is differences, but overall, the same message. And now, get this, okay? You really, hopefully, this is changing your paradigm, okay, uh, to this, but the degree to which a church received Paul's message and acted, you know, fulfilled it, acted it out, so to speak, to that degree is how he judged how spiritual they were. You get that? Yeah. Not, not because if you're talking about gifts, Corinthian church had it going on. They, they were the gift church. I mean, everything was happening there. And yet Paul didn't really commend them too much, all right? And he even told him one time, he said, you guys, because you have these gifts and you've got these super apostles coming through there and they're saying all kinds of stuff and uh, I'll be there soon and we'll see what power they have. We'll see what they, not what words, not who can preach the best, 
but, but who has power? And he even told me, he said, I, I, I want to come to you uh, as, a, as a father, but, uh, you know, I may have to come um, with a stick. Right? I may have, not, not the good side of the father, but the, you know, I'm coming to discipline side, right? And so he was very blunt with this stuff. And he said, you know, if any man uh, think otherwise, and think about this. He said, if any man think otherwise than what I've been sharing, God will show him where he's wrong. That's pretty bold, you know, or arrogant, depending on how you want to look at it, really. And you know that's what they were saying about him anyway, because he had people saying things against him, saying he wasn't even a real apostle. And so he was defending all that stuff. But the reason I'm saying this is I want you to realize that the level of your spirituality is not how much you shake, jerk, fall down, speak in tongues, how much you, any of that other stuff that goes on. That's not a, an indicator of your spirituality, right? The, the, the indicator of your spirituality is your obedience to the Word of God. It's that simple, right? It's what do you do with the Word you have. Now, and that means feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. It means, uh, you know, do whatever needs to be done, you do it, and it doesn't always have to look spiritual, right? And so here he says, if you've heard about this that was given to me for you, now listen to this, how that by revelation he, Jesus, made known to me the mystery, as I wrote a four in few words, now get that. We only have one letter to the Ephesians. And this one letter, in it he says, as I have wrote a four in few words. So obviously there was another letter to the Ephesians that he wrote to them and explained to them how he had received this revelation and this mystery that he starts talking about. One of the things that I noticed the most, the largest number of uh, letters we have to any church, per se, is to the Corinthians, right? All the other churches have single letters. Then you have letters to people, and you have usually at, a, at the maximum two, except with the Apostle John, and we have three, and those get shorter each time, really. I mean, it's you know, really short there. And so <clears throat> when you look at overall the letters that were written, especially to churches, now we I've done some research into uh, church planting and stuff, and I don't want to get off too far on this, but I just want to bring this point out. The longest place Paul spent, or the longest time Paul spent in any one place was with the Corinthians. And he stayed there 18 months, okay? Uh, except when he was in jail, of course, and then that wasn't by choice, but he was there for two years. So, but whenever he, st when he was with the Corinthians, he was there 18 months. You read of all the other places he planted churches. One of them uh, was... The uh, church was in a place called Berea. And in Berea, the thing that stood out about them was that, what? They searched the scriptures to see whether the things that Paul said were true. Isn't that right? Isn't it funny that the church that searched the scriptures, he never had to write a letter to them saying, you guys are messed up. Because we don't have any letter to the church of Berea. We only have letters to the churches that were messed up. And they were the ones that didn't really receive his message, didn't receive him with the authority that he had, and did not walk out his message, and got hung up on things, you know, on the, on the, the pizzazz, you know, the things that drew attention, gifts, power, things like that. But, and those are the ones he had to write to him and said, you guys are messed up. And really called him carnal. I mean, he was really blunt, right? And so there's a correlation there. That the fact that the closer you stick to the scriptures, the less you have to be corrected. Amen? And you check things out. You don't just listen to anything. Oh, that's neat. Oh, that's fun. You know, let's all, you know, do a fire tunnel. Everybody run through it and get blasted. Okay? <laughs> you know, that, that might help, might help some people here. It's not going to help anybody out there. Right? And the reason the church is here is because we're to help people out there. We are to be the salt of the earth. Amen? We're to be the light. And so all, everything we do has to go back and be filtered through the Great Commission. Everything. If whatever we're doing doesn't help the church grow up so that it can do the Great Commission, it's wasted time. Amen? Amen. So this isn't about you being somebody and being super spiritual and all that. This is about you being a part of the body of Christ and you finding out who you are so you can fill your position because every joint has to supply every piece that it's been given. Amen? The church needs every piece that you have, right? All right, now, he says, uh, whereby when, he says, I wrote a, as I wrote a four, a four in few words, 
Verse 4, whereby when you read, so now we know it was a letter, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So now in that letter, he talked about the mystery of Christ. So we're going to start seeing this more and more. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So now we know there's a mystery that was being, uh, had been withheld, right? And people say, well, that's not fair. It's God's decision, right? People say, well, see, here's the problem. We try to make God democratic, okay? Christianity is not a democracy, okay? I mean, let's just throw it out there. Let's be blunt. The United States is not a democracy, right? A pure democracy would not be good, okay? It wouldn't work because then it's just majority, right? Okay. <laughs> Deciding whether to go on that way or <laughs> start talking about that we are a constitutional republic, okay, which protects the minority from the majority, which is the purpose, whereas a democracy didn't do that. So when everybody talks about a democracy and all that, that's, that's, we were never meant to be a democracy. Democracy doesn't work. It, it doesn't benefit people. It hurts people, right? Because then all it has to be is a, a, a majority, right? So now, but the problem is people try to make the kingdom of God a democracy, and it's not, Right? Technically, it would be closer to a constitutional monarchy. You understand that? It's kind of like what England has, okay? A constitutional monarchy. And what that means is there is a king, but they are subject to the laws that are established. Now, in our case, our king established the laws, but he has also put himself in alignment with those laws, and his laws are in alignment with his nature, so it's not that he, this keeps him from violating it. It's the fact that his nature would never violate it. Amen. You got that? Yes. And the, the laws that he put out shows us his nature yes. so that we know that we can, uh, well, we, that we can count on him to be uh, the same forever. Yes. Amen? Yes. So now, okay. Now notice this. So <clears throat> here he says that this mystery was hidden. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of things. Remember that mystery part. We're going to come back to that. Look on your next page, page 29. <clears throat> and here I just have a list of some different words and different things actually for the next few pages here. We're not going to touch all of them, but it's things for you to think about, look at, and search out. And if you go through a lot of our teachings, we have about a lot of these already uh, detailed in different areas, not specifically under these titles, but in the teachings themselves you would get them. But here if we talk about a spirit being dead spiritually, or alive spiritually. Now, when we say dead, we don't mean ceasing to exist, right? We just mean cut off from the source. That's what dead means in, in this sense. If you are spiritually dead, it doesn't mean that, you do, that you're not walking around, but you're walking around with a spirit which is the source of your life, but that spirit has been cut off from the source that gave that spirit. Does that make sense? And so a spirit cut off from the source of spirit life is dead spiritually. But now you get connected with God and now you are reconnected and now you are spiritually alive. And that's what happened now whenever we got born again. So we have a soul. And as we had talked about before, we gave the, the definition. The soul is essentially what makes you you. Okay? Uh, your spirit, for the most part... Your, well, your spirit is recreated in the likeness of God. Your spirit won't be judged in that sense. Your soul will be judged. Okay? That's why he talked about how bad it is for a person to gain the world and lose their soul. He didn't say lose your spirit. Okay? So it, it is your soul that is who you are. Okay? Now, you can be carnal, which means to be sense-ruled, or it, the Greek word for carnal actually has to do with the body, sarx, and it means flesh or fleshly ruled, or ruled by the lower nature. The renewed mind, or a spiritual mind, is, means not to be ruled by senses, but to be ruled by the Spirit, which is in alignment with this Word. Now, here's another thing that proves that the way the church has gone is wrong, and it's very simply this. In Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of that Spirit is the fruit of your human spirit, okay, in but the Holy Spirit is connected to you, but the Holy Spirit gives life to your spirit, and out of your spirit come those fruit. Do you get that? 
Those are not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, understand, the Holy Spirit has those fruit. They are His fruit, but He's an individual. You get that? But His life in your life should produce the same fruit. But it's fruit produced in your life. You say, how do you know that? Because one of those is temperance, which is self-control. So if that's not part of, if that's not your spirit, then you're not demonstrating self-control. You're actually being controlled by something else, which is not God's intention. Right? Now here's the thing. God wants you to follow Him. But He, but he does not want you controlled. See, the devil wants to control. God wants you to follow. Okay? If you, everywhere you read in the New Testament where it says uh, they were filled, this person was filled with anger, or this person was filled with the Holy Ghost, all it meant was they were influenced to the point that they acted. That's all it means. Right? Now remember that. That's a, that's a big deal. What that means is the Holy Spirit, you allowed yourself to be so influenced by the Holy Spirit that you were moved to do something. Okay? Peter, being filled with the Holy Ghost, stood up and spoke. Right? So he was influenced by the Spirit to get up and speak. But we have to realize these, these fruit in Galatians 5 has to do with self-control fruit of the Spirit in your life that you produce. So you have to produce this fruit. And this is the main fruit that Jesus is looking for when he returns. Right? Not healings, not gifts, fruit. You got that? There will be a lot of people say, oh, didn't we do these mighty works in your name? He said, I never knew you. Right? So we have to realize that you can do those things and not know God. You can know that there were people in Jesus' day. You have to remember, everybody that Jesus dealt with, Jesus never dealt with a Christian. Do you hear that? He never dealt with a Christian. He dealt with unsaved people. They were not born again. Right? Nobody got born again until the day of Pentecost, technically. Right? And, and at, at least till after he was resurrected. Okay? Because you couldn't get born again until he was resurrected. And so all the, the, the men that he commissioned to go out and heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils, all natural, unborn again people. Operating just like prophets did in the Old Testament. Not, not a big mystery. It's just Old Testament, the way the, old, the way the Holy Spirit worked through people in the Old Testament. The Spirit was with them. And that's why he said when the Spirit of Truth comes, he said that he is with you and he shall be in you. Well, up to now, he's been with you. When they went out and healed the sick, guess what? He was with them. But then he's in them, right? After the day of Pentecost. And so we see a change. And that's the big thing that we have to realize is this change that takes place. Now, uh, in Proverbs 23, 7, the Bible says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And as a man thinketh in his heart, that's how he is. But now notice, your heart thinks. Okay? Now, your heart is everything you are. It's all together. It's everything, basically. It's everything wrapped up in one. It's the one center. Uh, it is you. It, and if you break that apart, you'd go into soul, spirit, body, emotions, will, intellect, all that stuff in there. Okay? But we know this. We know that the heart is not the mind, okay, by itself. Because he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength. So we know that heart, mind, and soul are not all the same thing. Because he didn't repeat himself three times. Right? So they're all different things, different degrees of things we should say. Now, <clears throat> the body, obviously, now notice the body is physical and it has habits. Okay? It has voluntary habits. It has involuntary habits. But the main thing about it is that it, <clears throat> it has habits. Okay? Now, what that means is there is nothing that you cannot change in how you live. You are simply the sum total of what you have done repeatedly, right? And the more you do it, the more you reinforce it, and the more you reinforce it, and the more it becomes a stronghold, and the more you tie emotions with physical actions. And that's why we have words that make no sense whatsoever, and we have combinations of words that make no sense, such as comfort food. Okay? We call it comfort food. And we know there's nothing good about it, and that's what points it out as comfort. Right? But notice, when do you eat comfort food? You eat it to comfort you because your emotions are messed up. So now your, your body follows your emotions with food that has nothing to do with your emotions. Right? So now your mind and your body are working together against you. 
notice against you. Okay. <laughs> See? So the point is that you can train your body and your mind to do whatever you want it to do. So you are what you want to be right now in your actions. You say, oh, no, 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 I want to be much more. No, that's not true. If you wanted to be more, you'd be doing the things that would make you more. Just that simple, right? Here we are, February 1st. One month ago, many people said what they wanted to be, and then they didn't follow through, which proves you didn't really want it. You knew you needed it. You know you should want it, but you weren't really that sure about it, but you were going to say it anyway because you don't want to be without a New Year's resolution, right? And so you, you throw one out, and then you don't live by it. And, but what you do every day is what you want to do. You make time to do what you want to do. It's that simple. Now, there are some things, you know, people say, well, no, you don't understand. I have to go to work. Well, that's still a choice. You're making a choice. That's better than not going to work, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not arguing with the choice. I'm just saying you still had a choice. Some people wake up and go, no, I'm not going to do it. So it's a choice, right? And then they go hungry, right? So anyway, all right. <clears throat> Boy, I could take off on so many different areas. <laughs> the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. I'm just leaving it there. All right, so okay. Now, <clears throat> so, you, but you can create habits in your body, in your mind, right? Now, but the problem is most people won't take won't make the effort to truly make the habits. And so they move toward it. If you were really, if you really decided to be exactly on the outside the way you are on the inside, if you said, I'm going to do what I need to do to really be who I am, and then you went after it whole, I mean wholeheartedly, right? And if you did it with a bunch of other people, immediately, before the sun went down, you would be classified as a cult. Because you would stand out so different from the majority of other humans that immediately people would say, oh, that's a cult. Look at them. They're all doing this together. Why are you doing it? Well, we're doing it for spiritual reasons. Oh, yeah. It's for religious cult. Religious nuts. There they are. Right? And the thing is, but yet you do it in any other field and people admire you for it. Right? You join the military, what do they do? They take a bunch of people, put them in the same room, keep them there for six weeks, train them, equip them, brainwash them. When they come out, they walk different, talk different. They are different. What, do they, what happened to them? They were brainwashed, and now they are soldiers or Marines or whatever group. You know, I don't want to offend anybody. Okay? <laughs> but you are, and, and yet, and people come back and say, where'd you go? Oh, I was at boot. Really? Oh, wow, man, that's awesome. Well, you know, I really look up to you. And, it, and yet if you said, if you did the same thing with Christianity, you know, where, where have you been? Oh, I've been out here on the lake. We've been at this resort thing and we've been out there and, you know, we went through mind renewal and we did this. Why? Well, just, you know, I just want to be what Jesus wants me. Well, man, you, y'all are crazy. Y'all are a cult. What is that, a cult? <laughs> Every other group, you know. Uh, you know heard you went to the, you know, the weight loss clinic. Uh, weight loss clinic. We stayed out there 30 days and did all this. And look, look at you. You're different. Oh, I'm so proud of you. You know? Yeah, next week I'm going to this religious camp. Oh, be careful. <laughs> oh, don't, don't go to the religious camp. So they, they don't mind if it's body or if it's soul, but don't let it be spiritual. Amen. And what does that tell you? Tell you the world doesn't know what it's talking about. Yeah. Amen? Tells you that the world is against you being who Jesus wants you to be. Right. So, and if you were going to do it, it would take that kind of effort. If you were really going to do it full out as quickly as... See, most people, as we talk about in renewing the mind, if you really want to renew the mind, the way to do it is in a period of time, relatively short. Most people try to renew their mind over 20, 30 years, which doesn't really work because you get it renewed 5%, then you go back in the world, and 3% gets unrenewed by next week. And so you're constantly fighting, and you're going back and forth, back and forth, when in reality, if you did it just the way the military does it or you know, these other groups... You would actually get there quicker and faster, but it might take four weeks, six weeks, 90 days, whatever it is. And if you did it, you would come out so vastly different that it would be phenomenal. And yet, but most people will never do that. You know, well, I got to work a job. I, I get that. But what do you do in your off time? Well, you know, when I get home, I'm just so tired. You know, I just want to sit in front of the TV and do nothing. You know, I just want to veg out. Well, there's a reason they call it vegging out, right? Vegetables don't think, right? 
That's okay. So anyway, all right. So let's look look at some of these other words. Y'all realize any one of these could be a seminar topic, right? Everything we're talking about could be a topic on its own. All right. So now you have the conscious mind. This is on page 30. You have the conscious mind. You have the unconscious mind. Okay. Now the unconscious mind is technically the go-between between between your spirit and your conscious mind, your soul. Okay. Your, Your conscious mind, they talk about working memory, right? And then they talk about unconscious memory. They talk about these different aspects. Your conscious mind is what how, it's like the uh, memory right now, what you're dealing with, you know, and what you have to have functioning as you go through daily life. Your unconscious mind is where it is in the background where you might be doing work, but yet there's something else going on, maybe emotional, maybe family, relationship, or something like that. You can have other stuff going on, which will sometimes distract you from your conscious mind, but there, usually you can separate the two. But your unconscious mind is more directly related to the spirit and that's why subliminal suggestion works so well is because it bypasses the conscious mind and gets to your unconscious mind which more has direct relationship to how you act right so now again we cover most of this in the mind renewal thing so if you uh, if you want to know more about that you can do that that way the brain is the organ it's a physical organ used to they thought that the brain all this activity uh, you know, took place in the brain and not so much takes place in the brain as much as around the brain and it zips around different parts and actually if you cut off half the brain and removed it, uh, which some people I think have done that, but beyond that, um, <laughs> especially some of the drivers I've seen that does, but if you take out half that brain, <clears throat> the way the brain works, one side works from big picture to detail and the other side works from detail to big picture. Right. If if you're familiar with Caroline Leaf, then she goes into a a lot of this area. If you take out half, both sides of the brain basically do the same thing, just from a different direction. So you could actually survive and function without one side of the brain, and you could. And but you would think a certain way. But also, if a person is uh, say born blind, then that part of the brain that works with the visual uh, doesn't ever get use. So other parts of your senses will start to take on that part of your brain and start to function and use that real estate in your brain and will make, that's why you see a person that sometimes they're blind, but their hearing is phenomenal. Why? Because the hearing has now moved over into that area of the brain and takes up the space that the visual used to take. And now it has more space to work with. So it's much more fine tuned, right? And so, uh, when a person, um, you know, there's parts of the brain that can be damaged and yet people still overcome it. <clears throat> Listen carefully. Bottom line, what I'm getting to is this. I don't care what uh, damage has been done. Your, your body, just in and of itself, just from a human natural aspect. I'm not even talking about the power of God, right? You add the power of God in there, everything's, you know, turbocharged. But just from a strict, natural, human aspect, what, regardless of what damage is done, physical damage, you can overcome it. I'm serious. I'm not talking about just, well, by faith, we can. No, I'm not even talking that way, right? By faith, absolutely, you understand. But I'm saying just from the natural aspect, you can overcome any physical damage. Your body will, your mind especially, will rewire itself to function correctly if you don't block it by believing that it can't happen. So the key is to keep an open mind on it. No matter how much damage has been done, you can still function normally and even super normally if you don't buy into the lie that, you know, just like lies and everything else. Well, you get past this age, this is what's going to start happening. That's a lie, right? You don't have to buy into that. So, all right, now, next. Um, the mind, which is a function. The mind, the function of the mind is to think, to figure out, as we would say, or to compute. Okay. Now, the heart, like I said, is the combination of all the, it's the sum total of you as a whole, but it is in and of itself um, the believing organ. Okay. If, and it's not in a location. I mean, obviously you have the physical, the cardio, the physical heart, but you also have a um, 
it's overall, just like everything else is overall. Okay? It works in every part of your body. The conscience has to do with morality and ethics, and it is the part of the life of God that is in every human. When a, the spark of life that allows every human to live is that initial contact with God and gives every person the intimate knowledge that there is a God. Right? Now, they may not know who He is, but every, I don't care what anybody says, every person believes in a God. They just don't always believe in a personal being. <clears throat> and many times when that happens, they change their God to, as we would say today, instead of Jehovah God, it's a Benjamin God. Right? Or they start following $100 bills or whatever it is and they start trying to chase money. Everybody has a God. The question is, which one? Right? And every human knows every human was created to worship. And every human will worship something. Right? It doesn't always have to be spiritual looking, but it doesn't have to... Uh, I've got my dry erase here, so I guess I can use this. So, <clears throat> now, notice the next one, emotions. The emotions, that has to do with your feelings. Okay? And I'm not talking about your you know, physical senses, of course. But your emotions are usually uh, tied <clears throat> with your preconceived ideas of your culture. Okay? There are things that you do in one culture that will hurt a person's feelings that wouldn't hurt a person's feelings in another culture. So a lot of emotions and feelings have to do with culture. Okay? Now, by the way, since we're talking about this, the word culture is actually made up of two words. The first word, cult. Okay? And what that means is that culture is what a group of people deem normal and how they function. Right? So there would be even national cults meaning a, a national uh, way of doing things, right? And, you know, America is known as a melting pot, and people come in and they should assimilate and all that, and that is the American culture, meaning we have a group of people that function this way, right? So technically the word cult is not necessarily bad. As a matter of fact, in the early days of Christianity, according to Josephus, which was a Jewish historian, he said that this uh, Christus uh, was a, uh, he was a, a person that uh, they, and that these other people were members of this cult known as Christians. And so Christianity was called a cult from the very beginning, right? Because it went against the norm and did not worship the gods of Rome predominantly, right? Or Greece or any of those others. So <clears throat> anyway, next, the will. I'm going to be teaching on this in the very near future. And it's going to be a, probably a series because there's a lot to this. Um, but essentially... Nothing happens without you willing it, okay? You can sit there, and if I said, okay, I want you to seriously get up, stand up, but I want you to do it, uh, but not will. Not, I don't want you to will to do it. So leave your will out of it and just stand up. Nothing's going to happen, right? <clears throat> but you have to realize that what, what you do is what you willed to do, right? Now, there are some things that it's technically what we call not your will, but you'll do it anyway. So it, actually you did will to do it. You just didn't want to do it. See, it's the difference between will and want. And so, see, every April 15th, there are some things that you will do, even if you don't want to do them, right? There's things to do, so same thing. So, but the will determines what you're going to do. So what you do is the result of your will. Whatever it is you've done or did not do, you either willed or did not will to do it. Bottom line. So, that's, so what you do and what you don't do is nobody's fault but your own or nobody's you know, benefit or whatever. Next, intellect. <clears throat> intellect is just the, the degree of, really the degree of knowledge that you can operate with. And varying degrees, logic is how you figure things out. And these different words, you can actually look them up and see how they uh, fit in with overall. Reasoning is how you deal with logic. Okay, so... Choice, your choice is predominantly determined, number one, by your will, but also by where you keep your mind. Okay, if, if you keep your mind, let's say you sit around and you watch, uh, you know, violent movies all the time. Okay, you are more likely, if something happens, to react violently than if you watched... Peace, move, you know, peaceful movies, right? I know it's a broad <laughs> categories here, 
But I'm saying what you saturate yourself with, you will begin to act out. Right. It's that simple. So um, it's, re it's real simple, really. Look at uh, personality. Personality is simply uh, how you... Now, some of it... Now, understand, God knows all this. He knows the plans He has for you. He knows you. Uh, and, and there's a whole lot more to this. But your personality... You know, the old thing between nature and nurture, and it's both. Okay? There are, there are things that God put in you because He knows what He wants you to do, and He predestined you to do these things before. And so He gears you and makes you, you have a, a uh, you know, you're, you're somewhat preconditioned, but you are uh, made in a way, you're wired in a way that it makes you easy to do certain things, e easy for you to do them. Whereas other people look and go, I could never do that. Right? Well, they could. It just wouldn't be easy for them. See, I, I could live on the road. I could travel. I could live out of hotels, motels, you know, just going every day, pack up, load up, unpack. I could live that way. Wouldn't bother me a bit. I don't care what country it's in. None of that stuff matters to me. Right? And, and enjoy every minute of it. You know? Um, other people couldn't do it for a week. I mean, they would just, it would just drive them crazy. You know, they would just, it would just be horrible for them. But I was... To a degree, uh, this is how I've been all my life. And now God is using that for the benefit of the kingdom. Right? Now, I don't think it just happened that way. I believe God designed me that way. Okay? But I still had to say, okay, I'll use that for you as opposed to using it for myself and becoming a traveling salesman. Right? So at some point, I still have to agree to use how God has made me for his benefit and not just mine. Amen? So there's that, that degree. Now, your personality <clears throat> comes out, number one, uh, has mostly to do with who... Part of it has to do with how you were raised, but you can overcome that, or it can, if you were raised in a good way, it can, bend, it can bless you. <clears throat> At the same time, the other part of your personality was determined mainly by who you hang around, somewhat by what you read and watch, but mainly by who is around you most of the time. And, uh, and honest, just parents, I'm just going to tell you, you have a moral responsibility before God to watch who your children hang out with. Right? You can't just say, well, I'm going to let them choose. Then you are choosing to let them choose jail or death or anything else. Right? Your, your responsibility is to lead and guide and to show them the path that they're supposed to walk in. Right? Whether they like it or not. Right? There'll be a time when they can choose, but your job is to instill in them the right way to go. Amen? Amen. So we need to realize that. Now, next one. Person, uh, spirit. Yeah, spirit. <clears throat> yep, right way to go. There we go. Now, spirit. Okay? The spirit, no. Now, this is big. Remember we said that the soul and the, the mind figures things out. Right? But now notice, the soul, uh, I'm sorry, the spirit knows. It knows. Right? It doesn't figure anything. It doesn't, you know, it's not one plus one uh, equals, it's not that. It, it just knows. There's things you just know. And there's things, and this is one of the first signs of, that you are receiving revelation from God. It, it, for me, I'll tell you how it works for me, but I, I've heard from other people, so I know it's, there's a similarity. Is that, first off, well, I can just show you, and I'm going to have to hurry here. But if you go to 1 John... Chapter 2. Now, if I show it to you in the Bible, you'll believe it, right? Even if you're not walking in it, you'll still believe it. You, you have to choose to believe it before you ever walk in it, right? Okay. Here he says in verse 20, But you have an unction from the Holy One. Stop right there. That word unction is the same word in the Greek as anointing, right? You have an anointing from the Holy One, okay? And watch this. And you know all things. You see that? You know all things. There is nothing you don't know. Why? Because Christ is in you, and because in Him is hid all the wisdom, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge throughout the ages. Is it? Jesus knows everything. And the one who knows everything is in you. So you know everything. See, you know all things. All things are in your spirit. They're already there. Now, think about this. This is... Okay, okay we're going to jump here just a little bit. Okay? Two things. How do you think God is... At, well, some of you might not even believe God is going to do it. But, okay. At some point, 
every human is going to be judged. Okay? At some point. E even Christians. There, there is a judgment for Christians. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's, it's there. Okay? It's not the same judgment as for the world. It's a separate judgment. And it's for a separate purpose and a reason and all that kind of stuff. But how do you think he's going to judge you? Do you think he has an angel walking around with you writing everything down? Well, and that's how, oh, I remember he did this and the angel's going to... No. <clears throat> he's going to judge you <clears throat> because everything you have ever seen, thought, every, all that stuff, it, it's still there. It is still there. Now, it is in your soul, but now <clears throat> that you got born again, everything is in you. You understand? It's all there. For instance, <clears throat> let, let's, take it, well, let's take it easy where you can uh, be easier to, to describe how do you think gifts work? They work by the Holy Spirit, of course. But the Holy Spirit is mixed in with your spirit. You're one spirit with him, joined together. So whenever you stand in front of a person, this is why, uh, maybe it'll help you also operate in gifts. But when you stand in front of a person and we say, and God gave me a word of knowledge for this person. Tell me this, this, and this. No, he didn't. Not in the sense that he just spoke it. But the Holy Spirit in you pulled it up. You already knew that. Because you already know all things. Every one of us already know all things. And, and that means all things means all things, right? That's like being connected to the Internet. See, you're connected to God's Internet, right? There's nothing you can't find out. As a matter of fact, do you realize that when you find it on the Internet, that's not when it appeared. It was already there, right? And then you found it. Well, guess what? What's in you is already in you. God didn't give it to you. You got it? It was already in there. And he pulled that out. That's why technically you operate in that gift and you can operate it anytime you want, anywhere you are. For any person, you just operate the gift the way you operate the gift. And that operates in different ways according, according to 1 Corinthians, according to your proportion of faith. So you can get a person's, well, uh, God tells me you're having regular pains. Okay. Or you could say, God is telling me that you've been having a pain, uh, you know, in your right knee not in the front, but in the, kind of in the back behind the knee, and you've been having this pain going on. Matter of fact, it kind of comes and goes, but it really gets the worse uh, right at this, you know, whatever. And you, you say, isn't that the same thing? Didn't I just say the exact same thing twice, just one more detailed and one less detailed? What's the difference? My proportion of faith. God didn't give me more details. I just got brave enough to, to step out and start speaking it, and it started coming out. How? The Holy Spirit is bringing it to my remembrance. He will bring all things to your remembrance. You get that? So, so it's not you're waiting on, okay, we're just going to wait for God to, to move and give me a word. No, no, no. You stir up the gift that's in you. What gift is in you? Gift of the Holy Ghost. You stir him up. How do you do that? You start by speaking, right? You can start by speaking what you know. Wigglesworth said, I start in the flesh, but I end up in the spirit, right? So you start with what you know, and pretty soon you, when you quit, when you stop saying what you know, you don't stop talking. That's easier for some than others, but still, uh, you, you know, you just keep on talking. And, and the thing is, when you don't know what to say and you keep on talking, the Holy Spirit kicks in and it's your Father, the Spirit of your Father speaking in you. He'll speak, in, he'll speak your words. You see that? But you have to learn that He is there. So there comes that place. Now, where are we at? Two minutes? All right. Hey, there He is. <laughs> yeah, it's fun up here, isn't it? He's been waiting so long to meet you. He likes my desk. He does. <laughs> okay. So, now, go with me. Well, actually, with I'll catch him. I got him. <laughs> I'm a grandfather. I chase kids around all the time. So I, 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 got, I, got, I got seven of them. I, I am too. Now, who is this? This is my grandson. What's his uh, name? David. David. Hey, David. Hey, David. He said, ooh, I like it up here. <laughs> <laughs> got a future preacher up here. <laughs> Amen. His mother Amen. Died. Ah, okay, well, uh, come to me during break and bring him back. Bring him back over there. Okay? Yeah. We'll do that now. All right, thank you. All right, now. <clears throat> First off, remember, the Spirit knows all things. It doesn't have to figure things out. It knows. You got that? So if you know all things, you just don't know you know them. But then, see, now if you want to meet somebody that knows they know all things, all you have to do is talk to a teenager. Because <laughs> they know, they know they know, and they know you don't know. <laughs> okay? So, now, but notice this goes back to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Right? Old things have passed away. All things become new. All things are of God. And so that is what's in you. See, all I'm trying to do this week is get you to realize what you already have and to know that he is wanting to live his life through you even more than you want to do it. But to do that, that means that you're going to have to accept the fact that 
you, you're so much stronger than you think you are. You're so much bigger than you think you are. You're so much more in the spirit than you think you are because you still think that God is doling it out a little bit and kind of, you know, hanging the carrot out there to, to get you to come on down. No, he's already said, look, I know what I have for you. I've already dumped it all in you. I'm not holding anything back here. Here's my name, my power, my word, my spirit. Here it all is. Do something with it. Show me what you can do with it. Right? And he says, now, walk like my son. He said, you want to, you wanna, God, how do I do this? How do I walk in all this? Oh, look at Jesus. Oh, okay. What did Jesus, you notice all through the Gospels, it never says, and Jesus, operating by word of, the, word of knowledge, said, it doesn't say any, it never mentions any of that. It never mentions a gift. Why? Because for him, it wasn't a gift. You understand that? For him, it was his nature. It was who he was. He walked in the fullness of the Spirit, not the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. See, gifts of the Spirit are burst of power. But the fullness of the Spirit is you just walk with God. And whatever is necessary, it's there. You know, if you need to feed somebody, you don't have a problem pulling money out of your pocket. Why? Because you know God put it there to begin with. And even if you empty your pocket, you know God will fill it. That's faith. When you trust him, say, you know what? Here, yeah, take that. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to pay your bills? I haven't been paying them in years. What do you mean? God's been paying them. <laughs> Amen? No fear of lack. No fear of failure. No, you have no fear. Because, and now, now, you want the secret? You want to know how to walk there? I can tell you. I've got to send you a break. Well, I'll send you a break, and then we'll come back later and tell you. How's that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering. That's trying to pull the, uh, you know, trying to pull the soap opera, you know. Leave you, leave you hanging there. Okay, Here's, here is how to walk with no fear, no lack, uh, no fear of failure. I, here's how to do it. Know and understand the love of the Father. If you know and understand the love of the Father, perfect love cast out fear. All fear. Not just some fear, all fear. Right? Fear of what? Fear of failure. Fear of man. Fear of... Sickness, fear of, does it, fear of everything, fear of catching it, does it fear of, no fear, right? Biggest fear people have, fear of death. Biggest fear. And he said, in Hebrews, he said, who, through all, who all their life were, were in bondage to fear of death. See, so as long as you have fear of death, you're still in bondage. There will still be things you won't step out into because you're afraid of death. So whether it's physical death, death of reputation, death of whatever, uh, position, whatever it is you want to, but there's that fear. But when you know and understand the love of the Father, fear is gone. And when you have no fear, you don't fear lack, you don't fear failure, you don't fear, you know, well, well don't step out there too quickly, we get ahead of God. Okay, it is impossible to get ahead of God. <laughs> he was here before you, he'll be here after you, right? He's faster than you, right? You're not going to get ahead of God. Amen? But it's according to your proportion of faith. And your proportion of faith is according to how much you know and understand the love of God. It is that simple. When you know his love for you, you know he's not going to let you fail. You know he's not going to let you go hungry. He's not going to let you lack. He's a good father. Amen? Amen? He wants to take care of you. He just wants you to trust him. Amen? And that's called faith. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world. <laughs>